Hi folks, hope you are okay. We're looking at the book by John Murray. Uh, it's called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. It's only a small book, but it's quite profound. It's quite a deep book. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, a Muslim uh, commentator, I caught a Muslim commentator uh, making a, a snide comment uh, on a YouTube that oh Jason looks kind of a spent force. No, I'm strong in the faith. Um, it's just my mom is seriously ill. I have to travel to UK. My wife was rushed into hospital yesterday with a couple of very serious killer diseases, and um, she's slowly on the mend today. So, with that kind of issue and challenges, with your mom on the verge of dying and your wife with two serious illnesses and diseases who also could have died yesterday i think uh, you'd be looking a little bit tired so for the muslim who made that comment uh, i'm standing strong in my lord and my god is faithful and he is the true and living god so stick that in your pipe and smoke it um this is not my original thought in terms of quotation from Dr. Richard Spencer. Uh, Dr. Richard Spencer has a series of lectures. I also have a PDF of Mary's uh, writing and so I'll be dipping into that from time to time as well and giving my own thoughts but I don't want to claim complete originality because of Dr. Richard Spencer notes. So uh, redemption accomplished applied uh, published by Erdman, also published by Banner Truth. The book is to be redeemed, is about to be redeemed, means to be freed from captivity by the payment of a ransom. So to speak of the redemption of man necessarily implies that man is in bondage. It is possible for man to be set free from bondage. So let's pray. Father God, we ask for your forgiveness and cleansing. We acknowledge our foolish ways and we pray that this study will be to edification in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to go on for quite some time. It's going to be an in-depth study. Mary says in his preface, the accomplishment of redemption, or as it has frequently been called, the atonement, is central in our Christian faith. To speak of redemption also raises some questions. To whom or what is man in bondage? Who is able to redeem him? What is the price of his redemption? Why is it desirable for him to be redeemed? What does he need to do to secure this redemption? And so Mary answers these questions. In the preface of his book, Redemption Accomplished Applied, Mary says, thought and expression stagger in the presence of the spectacle that confronts us in the vicarious sin bearing of the Lord of glory. Here we must realize that we are dealing with mystery of godliness and in eternity will not reach the bottom of it nor exhaust its praise. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'll say it again. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Mary writes in his preface, I can only hope that the reader will find these studies a consonant with the witness of the Holy Scripture as the only infallible rule of faith, and that by God's grace, what is accordant with Scripture will elicit the response of faith and conviction. Mary's foundation. We will look at the purpose of all creation and therefore of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The word of God contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament is the only rule God has given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. So as we proceed, this is the only way, God bless you, Ryan, uh, God bless you, brother. This is the only way, uh, Ryan, do you want to come on? If you want to come on, I can send you the link, and as I go through, 
the the material you can pop uh, you can share some of your thoughts brother if you want to so if you want to come on you're welcome to come on just let me know if you want to come on brother. So our foundation as we go into the doctrine of the atonement and its implications is the purpose of all creation and therefore of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The word of God contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament is the only true rule of faith, a rule of God that's given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. So we don't, we don't need any other rule. We don't need tradition. Um, we don't need any other books like the Quran or the Book of Mormon. These are false books. We need, as a foundation, the rock of Scripture. And so in this, we have a hope. Everything that we teach in this study is going to be from Scripture. And so we must listen to Scripture and then obey it. Hebrews 12:14. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. To further motivate your study of this topic, consider what Joel Beek and Mark Jones wrote in chapter 23 of a Puritan theology. These writings reveal the Puritan conviction that Christ's work outside of us, an objective justifying salvation, finds its counterpart within us, a subjective sanctifying salvation, thereby promoting an experiential piety that lives under the shadow of the cross. By piety, we mean a childlike fear of God that combines living to the glory of God in every sphere of life with a reverential awe and zealous love for God in all its attributes. So we'll be looking at the necessity of the atonement, the nature of the atonement, the perfection of the atonement, the extent of the, to the atonement conclusion. We will then consider um, issues such as what the source of the atonement. Uh, redemption accomplished applied, page nine. No treatment of the atonement can be properly orientated that does not trace its source to the free and sovereign love of God. Just an aside, Rudum says that God's love and justice together are the cause, but God's love alone is really the source of the atonement. So let's look at the lo at God's love a bit more. So Mary is giving a more detailed understanding than Grudem here. Okay. Grudem is given, uh, Mary now gives us a, a deeper understanding about the source of the atonement. Mary points out that God's love is free. It is not constrained by anything or anyone outside of God. That's powerful. That is powerful. I mean, that statement alone just blows every human idea of God to smithereens. It, it, it blows our minionism out of the water free it is not constrained god's love is not constrained by anything or anyone outside of god that is amazing sovereign he has authority over all creation distinguishing it does not love everyone in the same way psalm 55 uh, psalm 5 verse 5 you're telling me to psalm 5 verse 5 Psalm 5, verse 5, yeah? It says, The foolish shall not stand in the sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Malachi, chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Malachi, Malachi, Malachi uh, chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. If you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart and to give glory unto my name as the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung among your face, even the dung of your solemn feast, 
and all that take you away with it. And then Romans 9, 15. So God's love is distinguishing. It, it, it's not just the same for everybody. It's an amazing thought. Romans 9, 13. Says, as is written, Jacob have I loved, but Uso have I hated. So God's love is free. It's sovereign. It's distinguishing. It's selecting. It's not based on our effort. It's predestinating. It has a particular end in view. It's not adventitious. Adventitious. He was not, he was and is eternally and necessarily love. Wow. Profound thoughts there. Absolutely profound. Perhaps the most famous line in all the scripture tells us of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16. But this question raises some questions. Uh, this scripture raises some questions. Why should anyone perish? To perish refers to eternal death, not just a physical death. Why perish? Romans 6.16. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Men perish because of sin, because of Adam and Eve's sin, and then they freely choose to trust Satan instead of God. That's what Adam and Eve did, and that's what we do. Adam's sin put all men in bondage, Romans 5.12. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sin. So the endemic fall, Adam and Eve's fall, brought man into bondage. John 3.16 raises another obvious question. Why can't man save himself? The answer has two parts. No mere man is able to pay the price. It is too high. We will deal with this later. It has to do with the necessity of the atonement. No sinful man is able to do anything that pleases God because God knows and judges the motives, not just the deeds. So turn with me to uh, 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 28.9. One Chronicles uh, 28.9. One Chronicles uh, 28.9. And thou, Solomon, my son, knowest thou the God of thy father, and serve him with perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imagination and the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And you can read uh, Proverbs 16.2. Proverbs 16.2. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Proverbs 21.2 says, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the heart. So God knows man's heart. Sin has corrupted our entire nature, and we are naturally at enmity with God. Romans 8, 7, 8. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, says that God wants all men to be saved. Since being saved would please God, it must not be possible for those who are controlled by the sinful nature to save themselves, this includes accepting Christ. Therefore, since it is, it, it, it is impossible for man to please God while he is still controlled by the sinful nature, God must change our nature to enable us to respond to his offer of faith. John 3.3, 3, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So back to God's love. Now we have the context necessary to properly appreciate John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We are by nature God's enemies, subject to his wrath, unable to save ourselves. So praise God for his amazing love. Without it, we will be eternally damned. God did not have to save anybody. He 
Redemption and Complete Supply, page 10. It belongs to the very essence of electing love to recognize that it is not inherently necessary to that love which God necessarily and eternally is, that he should set such a love as issued in redemption and adoption upon utterly undesirable and ill-deserving objects. So in other words, God didn't have to save anybody. And now since the choice did not depend on us, we want to examine when God chose us. This love is eternal, Romans 5.8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 1.4.5, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adoption as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure and will. In eternity past, God saw us as sinners and freely chose to save us, not just to make salvation possible, but to save us. We've established the source of salvation is God's love. God freely chose to save some people in eternity past. The question now before us is why did God choose to save in the way he did? That is, why did Christ become man? Why did Christ die? Why the cursed death of the cross? Why was the atonement necessary? Was the atonement necessary? Before we get into the two positions examined by Mary, it would be valuable to give the state of the modern church to look at some of the historical positions that claim the atonement was not necessary or real. The necessity of the atonement was historically denied by some, for example, John Discotus. 1265 to 1308. A Franciscan friar held that the atonement was determined by the arbitrary will of God. Burkhoff Systematic Theology, page 368. Leo Sassinius, or Sassinius, 1525 to 62. According to Sassinianism, Christ is to be worshipped as a man who obtained divinity by his superior life. His death was simply an example of the obedience that God desired from his followers. Original sin, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and predestination were denied. The modern Unitarian Church is a lineal descent of the Sassinians of Poland. Christians through the centuries, a history of the Christian Church, D. E. Kearns, 1981, Zondran, page 308. The Arminians, one and all, denied that it was necessary for God to proceed in a judicial way in the manifestation of his grace and maintained that he might have forgiven sin without demanding satisfaction. Burkhoff 369. Frederick Schleimacher, 1768 to 1834, the father of modern liberal theology, and Albert Carecho, 1822 to 1889, were advocates of the mystical and moral influence theories of atonement and denied the fact of an objective atonement and therefore by implication also its necessity. Burkhoff, page 369. Many modern churches call themselves Christians subscribe to a liberal theology which holds a very impoverished and unbiblical view of the atonement. This view was part of the so-called fundamentalist modernist controversy that split the PCUSA and other denominations in the 1920s. The Auburn Affirmation PCUSA controversy culminated in the Auburn Affirmation, 1924, a document that objected to a 1910 requirement that ordained ministers affirm five essential doctrines. The inerrancy of scripture, the virgin birth and deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement of Christ, the physical resurrection of Christ, the veracity of the miracles of Christ. The Auburn Affirmation was signed by 1,274 ministers. So, over, yeah, we need to get this into perspective. 1,274 ministers in the early 20th century, Presbyterian, signed a document saying they do not have to subscribe to inerrancy, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, substitutionary atonement, the resurrection of Christ, or the miracles of Christ. That is an astounding statistic. 
And it shows you how easily denominations can collapse into apostasy. That is absolutely incredible, to say the least. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Oh, there's uh, quite a few people here. Sorry. Uh, Global Catholic Network. I'll be going to Speakers Corner, God willing. Calvinist Believer. Will you be debating Africa? Yeah. I'll be going to Speakers Corner, but if they whether they debate me or not, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be going to Speakers Corner. Ahmed Abdullah. I'm willing to debate anytime. You can debate now if you want. As a Muslim, we can uh, we can start a new stream and you come come and debate. I'm going to I'm going to visit my mum in UK. Uh, so in the next few weeks, I'll be at Speaker's Corner in London, and I'll be up for debate there. Uh, this is a troll. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to continue. Uh, keep the comments coming, but I'm going to go through the notes that I have. So 1910, the PCUSA, a Presbyterian denomination, had 1,274 ministers signed a declaration that they will they do not have to hold to inerrancy they do not have to alter the deity of christ they do not have to believe in the substitutory atonement it shows you how apostasy can quickly spread into a denomination so you know it was a, a downward slide they they started to doubt the bible doubt miracles doubt the virgin birth doubt the deity of christ then they doubt the atonement doubt the resurrection they become agnostics and then they become atheists that's the way it works folks gresham major yeah 1881 1937 just in gresham founded westminster seminary in philadelphia because of growing liberalism in princeton theological seminary he then also left the pcusa to found the orthodox presbyterian church because of the liberalism represented by the auburn affirmation he explained and refuted liberal views of the atonement in his famous book, Christianity and Liberalism, he wrote, Russian merchant, modern preachers do indeed sometimes speak of the atonement, but they speak of it just as seldom as they possibly can. And one can see plainly that their hearts are elsewhere than at the foot of the cross. The essence of the modern conception of the death of Christ is that the death of Christ had an effect not upon God, but only upon man. Sometimes the effect upon man is conceived of in a very simple way Christ's death being regarded merely as an example of self-sacrifice for us to emulate sometimes again the effects of Christ's death upon us is conceived of in subtler ways the death of Christ it is said shows how much God hates sin and since sin brought even the Holy One to the dreadful cross and we too therefore ought to hate sin as God hates it and repent some still again the death of Christ is thought of a display in the love of God. It exhibits God's own son as given up, up for us all. But these modern theories of the atonement err in that they ignore the dreadful reality of guilt and make a mere persuasion of the human will all that is needed for salvation. They do indeed, they do indeed all contain an element of truth. These truths are swallowed up 
in a far greater truth that Christ died instead of us to present us faultless before the throne of God. J. Gresham Merchant, expert, extract from Christianity and Liberalism, Erdman's 2009, page 100. So what we're getting here is the context. Modern man hates the doctrine of the atonement and the modern church hates the doctrine of the atonement. They might talk about the love of God, even repentance, but they don't want to talk about he was sin for us. He became judge for us. That's what J. Gresham Machen said. That's why he started Westminster Seminary, so that preachers would preach the true gospel. You're welcome. So we're going to continue now. This is in depth. This is going to go on for a few hours. This is going into the doctrine of the atonement. And uh, we're going to go into the next. The next one. So there's a so we looked at a, a variety of different views of the atonement from the Middle Ages up to modern times that watered down the doctrine of the atonement. Then we looked at Gresham Merchant, who said that these views of the atonement they lack any real biblical content, really, in terms of Christ died as a satisfaction for sin. So now the accomplishment of redemption or atonement is central to the Christian religion. We are currently discussing the necessity of the atonement. We have established that the source of the atonement was God's love, that Adam sin plunged man into bondage and death, both physical and eternal, and resulted in sinful man cannot redeem himself, and that God's love he freely chose in eternity past to save some. We have also discussed the fact that many people have denied the necessity, in some cases the reality of the atonement, these liberal views are not reconcilable with scripture and come ultimately from a denial of the authority or reliability of the Bible. We all have some ultimate standard for deciding truth. If it isn't in the Bible, then it is human reason. So a lot of these modern views on the atonement are coming from human reason. We should use our reason in a ministerial way, not a magisterial way. In other words, we subject our mind to the scripture the necessity of the atonement is an essential doctrine of biblical christianity acts chapter 4 verse 12 there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved wayne grudem also addresses the necessity of the atonement in chapter 27 of his systematic theology and off offers a few more extra In Matthew 26, 39, Jesus prayed, If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Since Jesus always prayed in the Father's will, and the cup was not taken from him, we can conclude that it was not possible for God to do so. It was not possible to, for God just to forgive. The atonement, was, the atonement was the only way that man could be forgiven. That's what we learn in Matthew 26, 39. If it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In speaking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Jesus said, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Luke chapter 24, 26. Which was a conclusion Jesus reached from the Old Testament. We have looked briefly at some of the liberal theories of the atonement and presented some arguments opposed to them that are not in Murray's book. So now let's return to Murray's book. Murray examines the two most important answers that have been given to this question by believing Christians. Why the atonement? 
Number one, the hypothetical necessity. A phrase that goes back to Aristotle means that which is necessary on the condition of the hypothesis that the end is to be obtained. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Consequent absolute necessity. Something that is absolutely necessary as a consequence of something else. In this case, Christ's substitutionary death is necessary consequence of God having chosen to save some. Hypothetical necessity. This view says that there is nothing inherent in the nature of God or the remission of sin that make a blood atonement essential. The necessity arose only because God chose to accomplish it this way, but he could have done it in another way. Berkhoff says, Berkhoff says this view has been held by some great Christians, including Augustine, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, Bavinck, and at one point, John Owen. Therefore, the type of necessity is certainly not an essential Christian doctrine. Calvin wrote in his institution, Institutes, Book 2, Chapter 12, Verse 1. Calvin wrote, It deeply concerns us that he who was to be our mediator should be very God and very man. If the necessity be quite into, it was not what is commonly termed simple or absolute, but flowed from the divine decree on which the salvation of man depended. What was best for us, our most merciful Father determined. The main concern of Calvin and others was to uphold the sovereign will of God. Remember that. The sovereign will of God. Aside in God's perfection, let's just camp at the side a minute and think about this issue when we're thinking about the necessity of the atonement. The perfection of God. The scripture tells us that God is perfect and all that he does is perfect. For example, Deuteronomy 32.4, in rock, his works are perfect. Psalm 18.30, as for God, his way is perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.48. So given that all God's ways are perfect, it seems that God is bound in some way by his perfection to use the best means possible. This does not limit his sovereign will, but recognize that he always wills what is best. Herman Bavink seems mostly agree with this view. He wrote that the atonement as a way of satisfying God's justice may be called necessary, not as a necessity that is imposed on God from without, from which he cannot escape, but as actions that are in agreement with his attributes and display them most splendidly. Herman Bavink, Reform Dogmatics, Volume 3, page 371. Bavink goes on to write, if God wanted to reveal himself in his consummate glory, then the creation and recreation, Christ's incarnation and satisfaction were necessary. His perfections were already made manifest in creation, but they are much more richly and superbly displayed in the recreation. Herman Bovink's Reform Dogmatics, Volume 3, page 371. So it seems that Bovink might well have supported Mary's consequent absolute necessity which he calls the classic Protestant position redemption accomplished applied page 11. Turretin's view in his book the atonement of christ francis Turretin, 1623 to 1687 writes that the necessity of the torment makes a glorious display of the most illustrious of the divine perfections of his holiness on account of which he can have no communion with the sinner until by an atonement his guilt is removed and his pollution purged of his justice which is inextricably demands punishment for sin of his wisdom in reconciling the respective claims of justice and mercy and of his love in not sparing his own son in order that he might spare us uh turretin's uh, institutes James R. Wilson published 1859. Consequent absolute necessity. Murray explains the word consequent in this designation points to the fact that God's will or decree to save any is a free and sovereign grace. That's the definition. Redemption accomplished applied, page 12. The term absolute necessity, however, indicates that God, having elected some to everlasting life, 
out of his mere good pleasure was under the necessity of accomplishing his purpose through the sacrifice of his own son, a necessity arising from the perfection of his own nature. Redemption accomplished, applied, page 12. Murray writes, it might appear to be vainly speculative and presumptuous to press such an inquiry and to try to determine what is inherently necessary for God. But it is not presumptuous for us to say that certain things are inherently necessary or impossible for God. It belongs to our faith to avow that he cannot lie. The real question is, does the scripture provide us with the evidence or consideration on the basis of which we may conclude that this is one of the things impossible or necessary for God? Redemption, redemption accomplished, applied, page 12 and 13. Anselm Canterbury. Just have a little rest here. A lot of deep stuff here. Yeah, I'll be there in the speaker's corner, God willing, in a few weeks' time. Thank you uh, from the Catholic. I am Muslim, guys. I follow Muhammad so, and Allah. Uh, Muslims, with the issue of Muslims, we've got no issue with Muslims as like yourself. But you have to realize that Islam is false. How can you? How can your Allah forgive sin? It's arbitrary. It doesn't make sense. If he gives one person, but he doesn't forgive another. There's got to be justice in the nature of God as well as forgiveness. So the Islamic understanding of the atonement, rejecting it, is arbitrary and it's not based on any real understanding of the nature and perfections of God as we are discussing here. Okay. So we are following a lot of material here. There's a lot of material going on here. A lot of things to think about, a lot of things to discuss. A lot of material. So I'll continue. St. Anselm of Canterbury, 1033 to 1109, was an early scholastic Christian philosopher and theologian. His motto was Fide Curens Intellectum which means faith in search of understanding. Thomas William writes that this motto means something like an active love of God, seeking a deeper knowledge of God. Stanford University is that quote. Murray's argument, he says the six arguments he presents must be viewed in the cumulative effect rather than individually. So let, let's just go back to Anselm, why Anselm? Anselm is defending the idea that the torment had to be. And I think that's where it's coming in, why. And he's saying that there's a, a faith element. And in that faith element, we have to accept what God says about himself. And about the atonement. The answer is important for the doctrine of the atonement. So Mary says the six arguments he presents must be viewed in the cumulative effect rather than individually. His first argument is that there are those passages which create a very strong presumption in favor of this in in favor of this inferior inference. Redemption accomplished, applied, page 13. Let's examine the two verses he gives as example. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. First argument. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God 
and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Hebrews 2.17 These verses strongly imply it was necessary that redemption be accomplished this way. Mary's second argument is that there are passages such as John chapter 3, 14 and 16, which rather definitely suggest that the alternative to the giving of God's only begotten Son and His being lifted up on the accursed tree is the eternal perdition of the loss. We can hardly escape the additional thought there is no other alternative. Redemption accomplished, page 14. John 3, 14, 16. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This passage certainly seems to suggest that no alternative was available. Third, Mary argues the gravity of sin required a sacrifice that only Christ, the unique God-man, could offer. Hebrews 9, uh, 22, 23. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. What are the heavenly things? The heavenly things of the people of God, they are not fit for heaven until their sins have been atoned for. Hebrews 10.10 10. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The nature of this better sacrifice is shown clearly in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After He had provided purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, Hebrews 1, 3, Hebrews 2, 17. For this reason He had to be made like His brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And finally, Hebrews 9, verse 11 to 12, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having attained eternal redemption. Third argument. He further points out that the Levitical sacrifices are presented in Hebrews 9 as mere patterns of the heavenly exemplar, which transcends blood offering by which the heavenly things were purified. He states in page 15 of Redemption Accomplished Applied, the necessity of blood shedding in the Levitical ordinance is simply a necessity arising from the necessity of blood shedding in the higher realm of the heavenly. Mary then asks, what kind of necessity is this that obtained in the realm of the heavenly? Was it merely hypothetical or was it absolute? Page 15 of the book. He gives then three sub-arguments to support his contention that blood shedding was an absolute necessity in the heavenly realm. First, speaking about the passage in Hebrews 9, Mary writes, the emphasis of the context is that the transcendent efficacy of Christ's sacrifice is required by the exigency arising from sin. And these exigencies are not hypothetical, they are absolute. Redemption accomplished, applied, page 15. To fully appreciate what he is saying, we must consider the typological symbology used in the Old Testament. Then look again at the passage in Hebrews 9. The Old Testament tabernacle. The tabernacle was in the middle of Israel's camp. The altar was in the courtyard. The holy place was first. The most holy place was behind a curtain. The ark of the testimony contained the law and had solid gold atonement cover. God appeared in a cloud above the cover and met with the Israelites there. Only the high priest could enter the most holy place and on the day of atonement, and only with blood. The atonement cover or mercy seat is central to the typology. It was the top of the ark, and in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, and also in Hebrews 9, in Romans 3.25, Paul, Paul writes that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. For sacrifice, atonement, or propitiation, 
the King James and ESV and in the Greek. It is Jesus himself and his blood that offer the ultimate propitiation or atonement typified by the atonement cover. Now reconsider just one of the passages in Hebrews 9, 11, 12. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. Man -made. That is to say, not as part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Sub-argument for absolute necessity. Mary says, The precise nature of Christ's priestly offering and the efficacy of his sacrifice are bound up with the constitution of his person. In other words, Hebrews argues that the superior nature of the heavenly exemplar on which the earthly tabernacle and sacrifice were patterned points, the need for the, points to the need for the unique God-man to be both priest and sacrifice. Reconsider Hebrews 1.3, Hebrews 9.23. Hebrews 1.3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And they, that he had provided purification for his sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Hebrews 1.3. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things, the things in the earthly sanctuary, to be purified with the sacrifice, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. Third, Mary writes for absolute necessity. If the sacrifice to Christ is the only hypothetical necessary, then the heavenly things in connection with which it had relevance and meaning were also only hypothetically necessary. That is surely a difficult hypothesis. Redemption accomplished applied, page 16. In other words, if God chooses to save some, then the intimate connection between those who are saved and the person and work of Christ are presented in Hebrews shows the atonement to be necessary. Application and preparation. To apply today's teaching, meditate on the fact that the source of our redemption is God's eternal love. And then consider John 3, 14, 15. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So I'm going to just unpack that just a little bit. The necessity of the atonement. It wasn't necessary in that it was an onus on God, like something that God had to do. He didn't have to do anything, okay? If he had to do something, it means he's not God because something outside of God is making God do something. So that's what a lot of all this language is talking about. But in the perfection of God, in the very nature of God in his perfection, it was necessary in the sense that God provided the perfect way for man to be saved through the atonement. So that's all the teaching and language that we're reading here is summed up in those words. I hope that's been a help to you. Now we'll get to the next one. So let's review what we've learned so far. We've established that the source of the atonement was God's love. Sinful man cannot redeem himself. God freely chose in eternity past to save some. The necessity of the atonement was an essential doctrine of biblical Christianity. Though we have to define what we mean by necessity. Jesus himself said, what is not necessary, was it not necessary that Christ 
should suffer these things and enter into his glory. It was necessary because of the perfection of God. Mary examines two views, the hypothetical necessity, the main concern for those who hold this view is to uphold the sovereign free will of God. Consequent absolute necessity, Mary argues that this is the classic Protestant position and most importantly, the biblical view. It is not inappropriate for us to examine whether or not the Bible provides a basis for saying that God had to accomplish redemption this way. Mary says that a salvation from sin, sin, divorce from justification, is an impossibility. And justification of sinners without the God righteousness of the Redeemer is unthinkable. Redemption accomplished, applied, page 17. True salvation produces fellowship with God, which requires a positive righteousness in addition to forgiveness. This righteousness cannot be found in any fallen person. Therefore, Jesus' obedience, incarnation, death and resurrection are necessary. So to support this argument, Mary adduces Galatians 3.21. If a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. He then notes in, Re in Redemption Accomplished Applied, page 17, what Paul is insisting upon is that if justification could have been secured by any other method than that of faith in Christ, by that method it would have been. Faith unites us to Christ and his righteousness. Faith, Mary says, the cross of Christ is the supreme demonstration of the love of God. We must ask, however, would the cross of Christ be a supreme exhibition of the love if there were no necessity of such costliness? Redemption accomplished, applied, page 17. You can join with Abraham in asking the rhetorical question, will not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis eighteen twenty-five. The writer says, commentating on Murray. I personally find this argument compelling. How could a holy and righteous God pour his wrath on his own son if that were not the only way to secure salvation? Would not such an act be wicked? You really? This ignores the fact that Christ voluntarily agreed to serve as a substitute sacrifice, but it was the only way to achieve this glorious end of displaying God's mercy, love, and justice. Six, Murray argues that the vindictory justice of God requires the atonement. He writes, is this invaluable sanctity of God's law, the immutable dictate of holiness, and the unflinching demands of justice that makes mandatory the conclusion that salvation from sin without expiation and propitiation is inconceivable. Redemption accomplished, applied, page 18. It's quite profound, really, all this. It's saying the only way that we could ever have been saved was by the shedding of Christ's blood. It's pretty awesome, profound stuff, really. Expiation, to remove sin without appeasing wrath. Propitiation, to appease God's wrath. So we're talking about propitiation. That's the right word. Deuteronomy 32, 35, sin must be punished. It is mine to avenge, I will repay. Exodus 34, 7, he, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. The, nor, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. Nahum 1, 3, Psalm 5, verse 4 and 6. Uh, the, with you, the wicked cannot dwell. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, bloodthirsty and deceitful men. The Lord abhors. Romans 3, 25, 26 says that Christ's atonement was necessary so that God could be just and the one who justified those who have faith in Jesus. In other words, the atonement was necessary to uphold God's justice. Romans 3, 25, 26. Two arguments that are often raised to the necessity of the atonement are, first, Doing so makes God inferior to man since man is commanded to freely forgive. This ignores that sin is first and foremost rebellion against God, so the greater wrong is done to him. Also, Burkhoff notes that God cannot be compared to a private individual. He is the judge of all the earth, and in that capacity must maintain the law and exercise strict justice. Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, page 371. 
Just gonna have a break for a minute. It's quite deep stuff. So are you following all this? So it's deep stuff. This is part one. We'll do part two tomorrow. Part two. The second argument often raised to the necessity of the atonement. Some claim, right, but as Burkhoff correctly notes, the Bible teaches us that the triune God provided freely for the salvation of sinners. The Father made the sacrifice of his Son. The Son willingly offered himself. Therefore, there was no schism but the most beautiful harmony. To summarize, the six arguments adduced by Mary in favor of the atonement be a consequent absolute necessity are there are passages that create a strange, strong presumption in favor of this view. There are passages that suggest that the only alternative is for everyone to go to hell. The gravity of sin requires such a sacrifice. Full salvation requires the righteousness of Christ. It is only an expression of love if it is necessary. God's vindicatory justice requires it. Before we leave this topic, let's ponder two more quotes that summarize the issue well the existence and attributes of god volume 2 by sharnak page 377 baker books might not god by his absolute power of pardon men's guilt and thrown the invading sin out of his creature but in regard of his truth pawned in his threatening and in regard of his justice which demands satisfaction he would not also consider the quote by gilbord the judge of all the earth must do right. Therefore, it was impossible by the necessities of his own being that he should deal lightly with sin and compromise the claims of holiness. His son can be, his sin could be forgiven at all. It must be on some basis which would vindicate the holy law of God, which is not a mere code, but the moral order of the whole creation. But such vindication must be supremely costly. Costly to whom? Not to the forgiven sinner. For there could be no price asked for him for his forgiveness, but because the cost is far beyond his reach, because God love is God loves to give and not to sell. Therefore, God himself undertook to pay a cost, to offer a sacrifice so tremendous that the gravity of his condemnation of sin should be absolutely beyond question, even as he forgave it. But at the same time, the love which impelled him to pay the price would be the wonder of angels and would call forth the worshipping gratitude of the redeemed sinners. H.E. Gilbert, Why the Cross, 1947, page 131, Wow, what a, what a quote. Absolutely amazing. As we finish chapter one of the necessity of the torment, let's all propose to meditate on the amazing love of a true wine, true, true wine God, Trinitarian God, which is expressed to the fullest possible extent in the incarnation, death, and resurrection, and session of Christ Jesus. What we're seeing here, my dear brothers and sisters, is nothing but this. The perfection of who God is necessitated the atonement. For in the nature and perfection of God, he had to be just and seemed to be just, and so therefore he had to punish. He is also all wise and all loving. And so all these attributes are culminating in the cross of Christ and the atonement, displaying the perfection of who God is. This is what we're le learning right now. Do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? This teaching should make us do that. We're now going to go in the second chapter of Murray's book. Mary sets up the chapter by writing the more specific categories in terms of which the scripture sets forth the atoning work of Christ, a sacrifice, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption. But we may properly ask if there is not some more inclusive rubric under which these more specific categories may be comprehended. 
He then proposes obedience to be that rubric. Mary writes, the scripture regards the work of Christ as one of obedience and uses this term. On the concept or the concept that it designates with sufficient frequency to warrant the conclusion that obedience is generic and therefore abrasive enough to be viewed as the unifying integrating principle christ himself said i have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me john 6 38. andrew murray in his school of obedience not john murray in the book that we're studying but andrew murray in uh, says the object of christ's life of obedience was threefold and a, as an example to show us what true obedience was as a surety by his obedience to fulfill the righteousness for us as our head to prepare a new obedient nature to impart to us andrew murray says that christ's obedience is not john murray we're looking at the book john murray but we have some thoughts by andrew murray on this atonement which dovetails into john murray just to make that clear andrew murray says christ obedience so what we're saying now what main term can we begin to understand the atonement and one is obedience okay one peter chapter uh, philippians chapter 2 verse 5 and 6 and 8 Your attitude should be the same as that of christ jesus who being in the very nature of god became obedient to the death romans 5 19 for just as through the obedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. 1 John 3, 2. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The obedience of Christ, Mary, John, Andrew Murray wrote, not John Murray. John Murray is what we're looking at, the book, but we're just looking at Andrew Murray, who has some quotes. They're not related, they're not, they're not brothers, so don't worry, okay? Andrew Murray writes about the atonement. Let every one of us who would know what obedience is consider well. It is the obedience of Christ that is the secret of the righteousness and salvation I find in him. The obedience is the very essence of that righteousness. Obedience is salvation. Because Christ was obedient. What did Christ himself say? John 10, 17, 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, authority to take it up again. This command I received from thy father. Note we are explicitly told the reason the father loved the son is that he was obedient to the command he received. Mary corrects a common misunderstanding of what is meant by Christ's active and passive obedience. These do not refer to his life and death. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father, John 10, 18. Christ was active in every part of his obedient life and death. Nothing was done to him without his permission or, would have been, or it wouldn't have been obedience. The proper meaning of these terms relates to the two different aspects of God's law, penal sanctions and positive demands. Christ was born under the law, Galatians 4.4, 4, as a representative, he fulfills both aspects of God's law, as Murray writes in Redemption Accomplished Applied, page 22. He perfectly met both the penal and the perceptive requirements of God's law. The passive obedience refers to the former, and the act of obedience to the later. Consider three passages of scripture on Christ's obedience. Hebrews 2.10 In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the offer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17, 18 He had to be made like his brothers in every way that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered, when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. 
How could it be said that the eternally perfect Son of God was made perfect or that he learned obedience? Mary points out that Jesus rendered his obedience in his human nature. Mary concludes from these verses about obedience and the atonement. I'm getting tired. It was not three through mere incarnation that Christ wrought our salvation and secured redemption. That I can, I, I can incarnation had to be obedient. It was not through mere death that salvation was accomplished. It was not simply through the death upon the cross that Jesus became the author of salvation. The death upon the cross was the climactic requirement of the price of redemption was discharged as the supreme act of obedience. It was not death resistantly inflicted upon death upon the cross willingly and obediently wrought Mary concludes this section by noting it was the obedience learned and rendered through the whole course of humiliation that made him perfect as the captain of salvation page 23 24 redemption accomplished to fly applied and finally we become the beneficiaries of christ's obedience indeed the partakers of it by union with him it is this that serves to advertise the significance of that which is the central truth of all salvation teaching or soteriology, namely union and communion with Christ. Page 24, Redemption Accomplished Supply. Next, we examine the specific. So, basically, how do we interpret the atonement? There are many words like sacrifice, propitiation, reconciliation, redemption. And he's saying that we can understand it through the doctrine of obedience of Christ. Now, we're looking at four. Word sacrifice, propitiation, reconciliation, redemption, sacrifice. The New, New Testament writers clearly portray Christ as a sacrifice, for example. Romans 3.25 God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Ephesians 5.2 Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We must turn to the Old Testament sacrificial system to understand what they meant by this terminology. I think uh, we're going to leave it there. I think we'll look at those words in another video. There's more people here. Okay, I'm going to finish here. We've got uh, at least three or four hours more study, five hours, six hours study. To go i know we're going fast but we've done reviews of the pages that we've done so i hope what we've done so far we talked about the perfection of god and that the atonement had to be because of the perfection of god and we've looked at that one way of looking at the atonement as obedience christ had to obey it was part of the atonement his perfect life his death and resurrection was a pattern of obedience to the Father. And that is a way of looking at the atonement. Okay. I'm very tired, so I'm going to close in prayer. And we'll continue our studies in this topic of the atonement. And I'll put the link there. Maybe someone wants to come on. So there is a link there. If anyone wants to come on, ask a question. Give a thought, please. Feel free. Uh, there is the link. You got a few minutes to come on, so feel free. I'm giving you an opportunity if you want to come on. So we've covered a, a lot of ground there. Saint Anselm is important on, on the understanding of. Uh, of the history of he, he was a, a seminal middle aged theologian who gave the doctrine of the atonement as satisfaction for sin, payment of a price for sin. Very influential theologian Francis Turretin, we quoted, very influ influential theologian. So, some big hitters there, yeah, for you to go and study. 
So I'm waiting. If anybody wants to come on, ask a question, give their opinion. I'm just going to close my eyes for a minute. So let's see if someone can. Okay. Just a bit tired. So the opportunity is there if you want to come on. Please feel free. got your opportunity you got your opportunity I've given it there You've got your opportunity to come on ask me a question so the links in the chat there if anybody wants to come on anybody wants to share some thought question debate discuss whatever feel free the opportunities there You know something, have you had noticed that you never get the Dawa teams coming here? Never once in all the time I've been on the internet. Never once. I don't think once have I ever seen any of the Dawa team come on live stream. My live stream to me. Not once. At least the atheist did. The atheist had some guts. I had Thunderfoot. I had Aaron Ra. I had all the top atheists coming on my stream wanting to talk to me, even private chats. But the Muslims, are, I've never met a bunch of scurdy pants in all my life. You've got an opportunity to question me and discuss and whatever, but there's no takers here. So this should tell you as Muslims, you need to calm down. You need to realize that you're being... You're being lied to you're being cheated and you need to get to read your bible and realize who christ is and what he's done for us he died on that cross for us gave his life and you need to realize that you're following charlatans you're following liars and cheats you're following dishonest people that are not really honest they're not really willing to engage and uh, it's sad you know for those who are Christians, this is a very deep video. It's not meant to be light. You've got my sermons. You've got my Bible studies. Those are a bit more lighter. But the Van Til videos, the John Murray videos, these are meant to be high-powered kind of deep theology to get you really thinking. They're not meant to be easy at all. But my preaching and my Bible studies, you can go to them and listen to them. Very, very simple to listen these studies are to be a bit more high powered in terms of theological content so if you're having trouble studying these or sometimes you have to exercise your mental muscles so that you stretch and think deeper so i'd encourage you to buy the book redemption accomplished applied by the banner of truth it's not easy reading it's a very tough read but there's a lot of deep stuff in it and it will get you thinking and it will encourage you in the things of god so i'm going to leave it now i'm going to close in prayer i'll try and do another video tomorrow and um, when i'm in uk i'll try and do a few other videos and finish it off in this series on john murray in uk so Hope that's been a blessing to you. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. I'm going to go. God bless you. And take care. Let's pray. Father, I pray that these studies in John Murray's Redemption Accomplished Applied would be a blessing to people, a help to people, an encouragement to people. Pray you bless them in Jesus' name. For your glory, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you and take care.